اوكي بس عم جو هيد بيس ستارت سو يلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uh, a 77 years old man presents to the emergency room with an eight hour history of right foot pain. His past medical history is significant for prior tobacco usage, 40 pack per year, uh, history of hypercholesteremia and coronary artery disease. He reports pain with ambulation in both calves, so it's something acute on chronic. Uh, examination examination reveals palpable bilateral femoral pulses by physic popliteal dorsal spidus and posterior tibial artery Doppler signals um, are present on the left and monophysic popliteal uh, and posterior tibial Doppler signals are present on the right so his main complaint is in the right foot and it showed uh, monophysic signals The most likely cause of the pain in this in his right foot is let's start um, yeah let's say first one common femoral emboli common femoral embolus due to cardiac arrhythmias no it's not uh, correct because he has palpable femoral pulse and uh, and there is monophysic signal and the history of uh, claudication Right, so this is, as you said, this is acute on thrombosis. doesn't look like an acute. Yeah. Because he has a tobacco abuse before, you know, 40 pack, he has coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. So it looks like he has a chronic vascular disease and suddenly now he has an uh, acute. This is the one yes. thing. What other things you can tell is not a thrombus? Is a, a, not an emboli, a thrombus. Um, on the left leg. Prediction. Yes. Yeah, his application and the left leg is better than the right side. So not it's only because of chronic. Uh, it's not like better, but it's no bubble pulses. It's, it's biphasic double signal. So that means he still have disease on the right. Because there's an emboli, yeah. then the right leg will have a bubble pulse. Right? Yes. Not biphasic. But here he found just biphasic. So that means yeah. he has a vascular disease in both legs, but now he has an acute on, thrum, on, uh, acute on chronic on the left. So all right. good, and again, as you said, coronary artery disease, tobacco, claudication, so all go is acute on chronic. So it doesn't look like an emboli. So first option is wrong. As no yes. history of also. Okay, next. Uh, popliteal artery occlusion, secondary to, to popliteal artery entrapment. No, it's wrong also because the presentation is uh, not classic for... Uh, Uh, popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. Uh, there is uh, claudication and monophysic signals, and it's not uh, the pain is not with uh, uh, with activities, not with ambulation. Uh, the Now most important, the Sam is the eighth, right? Because. Yeah. I assume also, um, happen in young people. You don't see it in 77 years old. Usually young people, athletics, they are, you know, very active. So the age itself will exclude a trapezoid syndrome. So it does not. Okay, let's go to third options. Occlusion of the tibio peroneal trunk due to embolus from aortic mural thrombus. Um, I will not also accept You're this option. Um, because there is no evidence of uh, aortic mural thrombus. He didn't mention anything about it. And the second thing, he has monophasic hypopletia, correct? Yes. So that means the thrombus is high. It's not tuber perineal. Because the only tuber perineal and emboli, then you have a bovitial pulse. But he have monophasic hypopletials. So that means that the problem is higher than tuber perineal tract. Okay, next one. Still here with Sam? Hello? We lost you with Sam. Okay. I mean, Ahmed, you want to continue, Ahmed? Monte? Yes. Yeah, it's so sour. Occlusion of the TB peroneal trunk due to embolism from aortic mural thrombus. The, the occlusion is above the TB peroneal trunk. Right. The popliteal artery itself is also involved. So, D, occlusion of the SFA due to right. progression of atherosclerotic disease. This is the most likely one until now. Right. Okay, the last one. 
type B aortic dissection extending to the left, the symptoms are on the right, and the femorals are palpable on both sides. No, the symptoms on the left. The symptoms on the left, but but it's palpable on both sides. So, so it's not, but there's no history. I mean, he didn't mention anything. So you can't, you cannot, always you have to answer code when they give you information. So you cannot resume as a dissection. In that session, they don't present this one. They present usual excision, it's an iliac. So most probably you lose the femoral and patient has more like higher level of uh, occlusion, you know? All right, so this will be the So you're already there, Ahmed. All right. A 79-year-old woman with history of arterial, arterial fibrillation presents with a nine-hour history of acute onset paresthesia and weakness in the left foot. She underwent uncomplicated dental procedure the day before and had her anticoagulant held, a fib of anticoagulation. He, her left femoral pulse is absent uh, with, no long, with no Doppler signals in the popliteal or, or pedal arteries. Duplex confirms reversal of flow in the profunda femoris artery with an occluded common femoral artery. The most appropriate management after heparinization is... Well, let's is start before, before. Yeah, go ahead. What do you think is going on? This is a nine-hour history of acute occlusion of uh, acute uh, ischemia, a secondary to arterial fibrillation who stopped on anticoagulation. Most likely, this is embolic acute limb ischemia. Correct. You know what, Rutherford, remember Rutherford Ahmed? This That's one is paresthesia, only sensory. This is type, uh, this is Rutherford 2A. We Correct. don't have any information about motor. Can you remind us with the classification for the other people? What yeah, one first, is, yeah. Rutherford one is, uh, is asymptomatic. Normal, yeah. Uh, arterial and venous signals are present, no sensory or motor dysfunction. Correct. Rutherford 1A, sensory is Ooh. affected, Ooh. motor is unaffected. Okay. To be motor is affected and sensory affected arterial signal is there in, in A, but is uh, maybe yes and or no arterial, but venous is present. And B, only venous. In the third grade, there is no arterial or venous with signs of irreversible ischemia. No motor, no sensory. Perfect. So number three, most probably you are talking about amputation because it's yes. irreversible ischemia. One is yeah. normal. So most of you are going to see a kid between two and three. This is a time where the two is an urgent. You need to do it, but not very emergency because you still have mild sensation, but motor still function normal. Whereas two B, it's more like an emergency, you know? Yep. So this one goes to A, I think, right? What do you think? To A, most likely. Yeah. No motor right. information here. Right. And look, she has a thrombus in the femoral artery. Okay. So what they say? Let's see what, the, what they said here. What the most appropriate management after hybridization? Okay. After hybridization, we should take off the thrombus. A left leg. Let's and go one by one, see what they said. Left leg. A left leg angiogram with initiation of thrombolysis. Angiogram and, th and the thrombolysis is possible, but I would go more of mechanical, easier and simpler with angiogram. Uh, let's see, how many hours been now? This is nine hours. And it's an emboli. It's not like an acute on chronic, right? Yep. So usually in in acute in the thrombus, usually the urgency more than in, in emboli is more than when you have thrombosis because no collaterals, you know. Be nine hours. She acute onset of paresthesia, weakness a weakness. Ah, she has a weakness. A weakness, she has more. Ah, we didn't notice that. So we're talking about two B. Two B, yeah. It's two B. Okay. Mm. Oh, when you have a 2B and it's been nine hours, I don't think it's a good time for thrombolysis, you know? Yes. Especially if it's an easy one in the common femoral artery. So I will not that. I'll take a right to surgery, do open thrombectomy, you know? But let's see what the other option. Go to B. B left common iliac to common femoral bypass with epsilateral grade saphenous vein. Big surgery for a long time in acute occlusion. Was, which is already has sensory and motor dysfunction. It's not, but it's not the best option. It's not, it's not the best option. Mm. Second thing, when you do fem fem, do you use a vein or a cortex graft? We use cortex usually for fem. Why not a vein? 
Um, patency is almost the same. It should be plus. It will it will be compressed with the patient lying soup prone. I believe. Yeah, this is really the two most common uh, places where you use a graft that you prefer. Or oh, let me say three most common location you can use, prefer a graft than the vein, which is fem fem bypass because it's easy to be kinked with the vein. Uh, Carted subclavian bypass also use a graft. We don't use a vein. And usually when you do SM aortic SMA bypass, unless you have an infection, it's better always to use a graft. Because vein, when you, when you return the bowel, is high chance, uh, tendency for kink, you know? Yep. This is the three places where you always you prefer to use a graft, not the vein. All right. Next one. Left femoral thromboembolectomy with four compartment fasciotomy. This is the most reasonable one. Okay. Next one. Uh, D, right to left femoral, femoral bypass with a prosthetic unnecessary surgery and the occlusion is femoral. Okay. E, anticoagulation with warfarin, which makes no sense. This is uh, rather for 2B right. and needs to be intervened. Correct. So this is an easy one. The only thing that four compartment fasciotomy, of course, anything more than six hours better to do it. But again, it's controversial. Some people do it prophylactic. Some people would like to wait. But uh, all the teaching is that more four to six hours than better to do a prophylactic fasciotomy, right? Yes. Right. Let's see who's uh, with us. Yahya. Yahya, you're here? Yahya and Malki? Yes, yes, Dr. Samar. Okay, I want to take the next question. Okay. Right. Uh, 60 years old male smoker present to emergency department with uh, 12 hours. Uh, history of a progressive severe uh, right calf and foot pain and uh, profound numbness. On physical examination, the patient has a normal right femoral pulse and dubbler signal at the popliteal and pedal arteries. The patient has a palpable mass behind the right knee. The patient the laboratory fa uh, values are within normal limit with the exception of creatinine, 1.8. The best next step is? What do you think he has, this patient? He has a mass behind the... Uh, Pobritial aneurysm. Correct. Thrombose, right? Yeah. So thrombose, pobritial artery aneurysm. So wait, 12 hours, but we mean 12 hours. Uh, what classification is Rutherford here? Profound numbness. One, uh, two, uh, two A. No, it's B because uh, mm -hmm. two A. You have a numbness, but it's mild numbness. When you go become profound numbness, then become two B or motor dysfunction. You know, uh, and they've been twelve hours, and he already had a thrombose, popliteal artery aneurysm. Correct. Yes. How would you treat the artery aneurysm, thrombose one? What do you think is the best treatment? Before we go to the other questions. Treatment for uh, thrombolysis alone, thrombolysis plus a graft, you think surgery, what do you think? Surgery, risk of uh, showering a thrombus uh, distally. So the best way for with the artery aneurysm is to do a surgery, do a bypass. Correct? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's one of the options. Uh, most people, they try, I mean, if you have a time, I mean, this 12 hours now is late, but you have a time, people do thrombolysis to get that, because what happened is distal arteries already thrombose here. They usually embolize. So they clear up the distal, then they do a surgery. So this is the most common practice. You know, they do thrombolysis, they clear the distal arteries, and then they do resection and they put interposition, you know, uh, vein graft. Um, unless if you have uh, arteries open and just a graft thrombosed, then you can go right away with the surgery. But again, if you have like 2B like this one, sometimes you have to go to surgery and do open thrombectomy. You cannot do just interposition graft. You have to do open thrombectomy for distal arteries, you know. Because most of the people see anterior tibia is already thrombosed. So, okay. So, uh, but what the problem with this patient? Her creatinine is 1.8, so she has almost like renal insufficiency. So they want to I'll tell you what your next step how you can make it. I mean, you made the diagnosis, but you think it's enough to make it, to do a surgery with, with just 
feeling a pulse, feeling a mass, and you know it's a thrombosis with the artery aneurysm, an acute thrombosis. You think it's good to just take out surgery without images, or you need an imaging, and why? Well, need to image to uh, which level the aneurysm to uh, normal artery, in which level? Uh, where it's level, you know where it is, it's pubitian artery, so we, we know where it's a level, so it's not a problem, you know? Uh, yeah, but this but... tell you to, for bypass. Correct. So the most important, you want to see how you're distal. How is it distal? Are they open? Is not open? From both, not from both, you know? So the reason why you need to see a distal, you know? So the most important, you want to see the tibial arteries. So what the best option is, start one by one. ACT abdomen pelvis with the bilateral lower uh, extremity run off. Patient chronic kidney disease with high creatinine, high risk. Right lower uh, extremity. Oh, no, so first option is wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the creatine is, is high, what else? You cannot see the T-bell very well, right? With CT angiogram, especially if you have thrombose, bobitial uh, arteries, not much, much cantrus will go down. So really CT angiogram and situation will not give you a good assessment of the distance, you know? Okay, let's go to the next one. Right lower extremity arterial duplex. Good option to assist TBL uh, fissures. But do you think it's enough to make do a surgery on that? We'll see another option. I, sometimes you have multiple options, be correct. But no, sorry, it's just a next step. So just one option. Okay. Uh, not really. I mean, duplex is good to see which open, which close, unless you have a very excellent, you know, technicians. Uh, usually it's not enough to give you enough information, you know. Unless you have an excellent, uh, because I saw some technician, they give you a duplex ultrasound result like an angiogram, but the majority they don't do that. So in general, it's not a good option. Next one. Uh, echocardiogram. Okay. And for uh, work up, but not for, uh, in this case, for bypass. So not help for bypass. Uh, echocardiogram, you don't need it because this is not an emboli. This is a thrombosis, correct? So you're not thinking about cardiac origin. So it will not, will not help you. Yeah. So will not, yeah. Next one. Right, lower extremity digital subtraction and geography. If you mm -hmm. have a left femoral approach. Okay, Good. go to the next. MRA, abdomen, belfus, and the bilateral lower extremity runoff. Mm -hmm. I will go with the D. Yeah, MRA, no. MRA is a long procedure time. The patient already had an ischemia. And you don't see whether this run off very well. So I'm already out of question. Echo is out of question. So the best one is really is uh, right. Just put a catheter, give minimum contrast, and you can assist your distal, you know? And you can even use it for treatment for thrombolysis if you have to, you know? Uh, the other options, you know, uh, you can do a surgery and do interactive angiogram. You know, there's other options. Interactive angiogram assess your arteries and decide if you plan to do surgery. But if you plan to do thrombolysis first, then better to do a femoral angiogram first. If you want to take the surgery without thrombolysis, because I said sometimes you need to combine both, then uh, you can go right away to the surgery. Um, I saw Rafat was asked, uh, let's see some uh, second opinion. Rafat, are you here, Rafat? I saw your name. Yeah, yes, I'm here. Um, uh, Rafa, sorry, I just... Uh... Oh, and using thrombosis yeah. is a very important you know, subject. How do you approach it? Do you do thrombolysis first, then surgery? You go right away to surgery? So, yeah, it's, it's like what you said, you know, in general. So it's uh, if, if if there is a time, you know, one, uh, like two B, two A, uh, you know, we do uh, thrombolysis first always because, uh, you know, it's less trauma to the tibial vessels and, uh, uh, you know, you can, uh, like you said, things are thrombosed in the tibial vessels and, uh, and it's better to do thrombolysis usually first. And then, you know, once you get them revascularized, you go back and you do bypass, same admission. You don't send them home. Now, if you have motor dysfunction like uh, this gentleman, uh, um, I missed here, I think it has a profound numbness, you know. A so numbness, he can yeah. argue, yeah, he can argue both ways, you know, uh, if he moves his toes and, you know, wiggles his toes or whatever, I would probably would do a thrombolysis. 
Yeah, probably for that. It just, you know, when you do thrombectomy, and that's for the juniors, I want to tell them uh, something about that. Whenever you do thrombectomy, this is a traumatic uh, procedure. So, you know, you can damage vessels with it. So it is, sometimes you have to do it. But if you can do thrombolysis when you have time, it's better uh, outcome in general in terms of distal vessels. The other thing is uh, for this, uh, for, for the angiogram and creatinine, you should not be deterred away from doing an angiogram you always i mean how much how many cc's you need do you think to do a, a leg angiogram Nothing. not much 15 cc's so so the impact you know as long as you go below 40 cc's of contrast usually excuse me usually it's okay to do that and you hydrate them so you should not be deterred from doing an angiogram on those patients intraoperatively or um or even uh, uh, before uh, most uh, before the surgery, but I would probably this patient. I would take him to the hybrid room, I shoot an angiogram, and then I see what I have, you know. And then uh, uh, basically, he can decide to do. But based on his exam, he can do bypass or not. That's really the key, you know, uh, the the exam, physical exam, and whether you have time uh, or not to do um, uh, thrombolysis. But right. there's no question that thromb thrombolysis is better initially for popliteal artery aneurysm. I agree with that. And Isam, he mentioned that last time very quick. He said, because when I asked him that all the studies showed that thrombolysis is better than open, he said, yes, when you talk about distal small artery like TBL disease, you know, when you talk about iliac common femoral aorta, it's not a major difference. But TBL disease make a huge difference when you do thrombolysis. Really, its outcome is much, much better than open thrombectomy. Right, Rafat? Absolutely, uh, absolutely, yeah. for sure. Yeah. The second thing yeah, I so. want just to mention that when you do thrombolysis, don't expect you're going to lyse all the clot because he has, and this is a bobitial aneurysm. So most of it is embolizing for a long time. So some of the clot will be very, very old, will not going to be thrombolized. So what in the end, you're going to open some, but you don't, I will not expect to have, see all three vessel artery back to normal because this guy is embolized. They don't feel it until they get, you know, to the last emboli, which really push him over the edge. So right, and, and so, mix old and new clots. And sometimes in these patients, in my experience, and I've, I've done a, a lot of these, you know, uh, over my career, you cannot even put a wire in a certain vessel. So there's a, and the way you do it, you put a, if they have good, you know, motor function, you put the catheter in, into the popliteal and there are end hole catheters where you start giving TPA and you watch them very carefully. These patients go to the ICU or to a place where, you can do uh, every hour a neurovascular check, and then you go from there. Most of them, you'll have some target, you know, by the time you're done with TPA. And then that way, you know, your surgery is a lot less than doing thrombectomy. So you just do a bypass, basically. And well, can you? Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I wanted to say with those patients also on physical exam, you always look into the other side. I look into the femoral after you're done with this, you look into the abdomen because there's a co you know there's coexistence of uh, triple A infrarenal and femoral artery aneurysms with these, and a lot of times these aneurysms are, are bilateral also. So, uh, okay, Rafat, for the juniors, for the fellows, is there any difference between surgical technique between open and uh, elective and emergency the approach? Like an elective, most of you go posterior and emergency go lateral, or does it make a difference? I think uh, emergency you always, uh, uh, you know, you don't go posterior, you go medial, you know. Uh, but uh, for elective and, you know, you try to go posterior, it's better if you have, uh, if, if it's high, low enough, you know. Some of them are high, you can't reach from posterior, you know. Posterior is much easier, it's a much less procedure. Than, uh, than medial, but for emergency, you have to go down to the to the TBT trunk and you have to select the vessels basically and do a thrombectomy on the vessels and uh, you know, the popliteal and the TBT. Uh, at least I go down to the AT uh, the, uh, and a lot of times I do wire guided uh, the thrombectomy so I can clean every vessel, but I haven't really, any, uh, I don't think I remember when I did the thrombectomy for this. It's been really many years, you know. We do the TPA for these, and, and most of them do well with TPA. I mean, if they come in, usually, of course, patients come in right away with DC. They have, unless they're, you know, not cases or they don't. I mean, there's severe pain, you know, usually, immediately. Most patients come in right away, you know. They don't wait too long to come in. 
is there any place for cover stent after you do thrombolysis? If you think, you know, there is, the there is, yeah, let's see. Let's say, yeah, there is definitely, definitely. Let's say you have a, a, a bad surgical patient, uh, you know, this would not tell CHF or older patient. Uh, patient does it sometimes, uh, they cannot tolerate big surgery. They don't have good enough vein. Uh, you can do cover stent afterward, but you have to make sure you clean, you know, because, uh, and I think most of the time you can clean them out also, except for the aneurysm itself. But cover stent is also a good uh, good option for those patients. But yeah. you know, on younger patient, bypass is the gold standard with vein. But uh, but cover stent is not a bad option. You know, and I know there's affliction and things like that with the knee. But uh, you know, the I've had I, we had a lot of patients with cover stent and they're doing fine. You know? So they yeah. they just you give them any platelet therapy and you wash them. You know, follow them like any other stent. Yeah. Uh, any question from the fellow about the VTR aneurysm? Because we are talking here about the subject before we move on. Any uh, question? Self-expanding stent, if a stent is right? right. What's that? Sorry? Self-expanding stent, if ever used. Yes. Self-expanding, yeah. You don't you don't use covered stents. So covers, uh, I'm sorry, you don't use balloon expandable stents. So let me, t if, if Dr... Uh, Okay, so can can I talk just a brief about cover stent uh, balloon ah, expandable okay. where they can be used? Yeah, exactly. So the only the, the only place that you can use cover stents are number one the visceral, proximal subclavian, proximal, not under the clavicle, and then common iliacs, uh, uh, and then basically you know uh, that's that's the only place that you use uh, balloon expandable stents. Everywhere else you should use self expanding stents. I know some people use short. The balloon expandable stents in the SFA, which is not a friction point, you can do that, but usually they fracture, I and mean, there's no need to. So self-expanding stents are the way to go here for sure, and cover stent. You know, cover stents such as Viabon, and, uh, you know, they are uh, Fluency, Cupera, you know, we can use them. The R is too big. We've used even aortic limbs for these sometimes in, in the poor surgical candidates uh, with a big, big R. Some, some of these R's are 14 millimeter, you know, and you can't use a, a, a Vibram for that or any other stent. So you have to use a bigger thing. So, and that's okay too. So, I agree with that. And uh, I, I, I never use, but I heard some people even use Supera stent. You so Pera stent, I know one, one, one of the people I worked with and uh, is actually published a lot back in the day. He, he uses to pay, he put Viabans and inside the Supera. Supera is a good stent in that area, you know. But, but I mean, Dick Cheney, you know, the vice president of the United States, that was he had bilateral Viabans, you know, and he's okay, yeah. it's fine, you know, and a lot of patients. So it's Viaban, it's fine, it's good enough, you know, so. But well, should not be your first option. So people don't understand the rock. I mean, no. this is, Still, it's no. only for high risk, you know. Still, surgery is the best option. Surgery is the best option for sure, and surgery with reverse saphenous vein, even with a graft, in my opinion, is probably better outcome than 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 just doing a stent. The only time to do stent for those patients if you know surgery is not a good uh, option, or you know the patients don't want it. Some patients don't want to have uh, open surgery, so that's another yeah. thing when you advise them to do. But but yeah, surgery with reverse saphenous vein is the best option for this. Let me ask you last questions, also for the fellows. Is that when you do a bypass, is it enough to ligate the aneurysm from both? I'm saying an open, not I'm saying it's from both. I'm saying open aneurysm, you found it, you elective yes. to bypass. Is it enough to ligate it, or you have to open and get the branches from inside, suture them? I, I, yeah, I, I, I ligate it. I, I, I actually, you know, the way I do it, uh, in, uh, I do end-to-end -end anastomosis. I literally cut the area and do, if the, if the vein is good, if it's not, you know, I do end to side and I like it, the, the, the graft. But, but if I can do end-to-end... -end, then your will yeah. refill from branches, from from like... If, if you can reach it, if you if you can reach it safely, but, you know, uh, it's sometimes it's hard to do because, and there are more complications in doing that than, than not. Okay. Having said that, I have seen type 2 endoleak with this maybe once or twice in my... In my career, yes. where you had branches, and you can take care of that posteriorly if, uh, if you need yeah. to. But uh, it's, it's, as a rule of thumb, you know, if you don't need to do something, and if it's too hard to do, don't do it. It's in surgery. You know, you you get you get in more trouble. So, 
you're in to take care of the cold leg, the aneurysm, you take care of that, and then you deal with the rest later. But if it's easy and it's right there, you, you take it out, you open it, like Dr. Yeah. Samir said, you know, you, yeah. so. I mean, when, when you do an elect, in emergency, I agree with that, but when you do elective, if you're doing posterior approach, then it'd be easier. Yes, you can just open it and yes. not, it's difficult. When yeah. you do elective approach, it's difficult. Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, yeah posterior okay. approach, definitely, you, you clean it, you know, so, and yeah. you do it, so. Right. Especially if you have compression, some people they come with DVT with compression symptom really. So you have to read the pressures, you know. This kind of people, you know. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's go to next question. So here we are. Seventy-one years old. Who's around here? Let's see. Usama. Usama Ahmadi. Ahmadi Sir Hi, Usama. A seventy-one year old uh, woman, a current smoker with history of ovarian cancer. Who was just hospitalized uh, one month ago for acute myocardial infarction, presents with a 12 hour history of uh, bilateral uh, leg pain and uh, paresis. On examination, she has uh, diminished motor and sensory function, and her leg uh, are purple and, and core. Uh, she has a, a remote history of bilateral ED extents. The CT angiogram images are shown in figure one and two. The best management plan is. All right, so let's go one by one, Ahmed, okay? She's 71 years old. She's a smoker. She present, she has MI recently. 12 history of leg pain. Uh, what was her for this one, Ahmed? Remember, she has dementia, motor and sensory function. Yes, she's, uh, she's uh, rather for two, uh, uh, a, two B, sorry. Two B, correct. So I took two B, so something in emergency, correct? Yes. At Batra Ilia extent before, she did thrombose. And this is a CT angiogram. You can see complete aorta thrombose here, iliac thrombose, renal is open, and she has an acute ischemia. Okay. So it's going to ask you what option, what are you going to do with this patient? You need to do something. Okay. Well, let's say one option, one option, because many options, let's start one by one and see if it's fit her or not. Okay. Let's okay. start with the first one aorta biofilm bypass. You think it's a good option for this one? No, I think she's in acute situation, so this procedure will take a long time. That she has a history of twelve-hour ischemia, and uh, I don't think it is it could be started with this uh, option. And she just had MI, right? But a month ago, right? Yes, yes. Uh, she's high risk for open. I mean, for uh, kids, I want to buy fem. This other things, you know. Yes. Okay. So I don't so think this option is. Doctor. So the second one is uh, percutaneous endovascular thrombectomy. Was stinting of the disease or to eat segment? Uh, could be one of the answers because we, we need to uh, to uh, to do him some big to me for the acute uh, sitting with the bilateral edX and the distal aorta. So uh, I think it, maybe it is one of the options. We'll see the others. Let, let me ask you a question. Let me see a question. You think this is an emboli or this is a thrombo acute on chronic thrombosis? I think it's, it's she's uh, acute on on, uh, on chronic thrombosis because she has right, right? Yeah, because because she has a previous uh, ill extent. So uh, correct. So she, can, so she has a, a long. She has history of vascular disease. So most of she has the disease aorta disease iliac, right? Yes. So this is acute on on chronic thrombosis. It's not an acute emboli from the heart. You just do thrombectomy, correct? So when you have acute on chronic thrombectomy, most of the times they don't work. Because you have a stenosis, you have an occlusions, you know. So usually they don't work, you know. Thrombolysis may work because you can get the wire through them and you can thrombolyse and then you can do in the vascular, but pl plain thrombectomies, they don't work, you know. Yes. Um, so, so back to in the vascular thrombectomy with standing of the disease aortic segment, it's possible, you can do it, but expecting that you may struggle because you don't know how her aorta before, how bad is that? It's going to take a, lot, a long of a long time, and she already P2, right? Uh, yes. She already 12 hours. She already she has paresthesia. She has uh, motor fun dysfunction, but legs, cool purple. Yes. So you need something quicker. Uh, yes. But it's an options if you have a good experience, hybrid room, very good endovascular. But for you guys, I don't think it's a good time to, like for you guys, you fresh graduate for juniors, I don't think you should waste your time trying to cross it, get the wire, 
because you know this especially when you close to the renals you, when you go to get the wire through this area you're going to go sub intimal no question so you may end with a dissection you may shut down her renal arteries unless if you go from above from the you know from the breaker artery but this is not an easy it's complicated it takes about a couple hours so so again in the emergency situation patients already to be People doesn't have a major experience in endovascular, I will not do this as a first option, okay? Yes. And this question, guys, for you, not for expertise. Always, guys, question the exam, this is for you, for junior. It's not for somebody who has a great experience in endovascular. So always you have to pick up the answer, which is fit your practice, guys, okay? Yes. So I don't think it's the best option in situation for you guys. Let's go to the next one. Uh, axillary by femoral bypass and fasciotomies. I don't think it is uh, also uh, a good option. Because, good option. It, because he has a recent MI, it will take a long time for do uh, the axillary by femoral bypass. Okay, well, let's go next one. Uh, bilateral uh, leg amputation. Also, I don't think this is the right answer. Okay. Uh, that's one open thromboembolectomy with stenting of the disease uh, or to a leg segment. I think this is the right answer. But we just talked, Ahmed. We said thromboembolectomy will be difficult, you know? Uh, and we just stand, we said that standing will be very difficult. So on your situation, guys, in this patient, uh, I think the safest way for you to just exit low by fat. This is for you guys. You see, I'm me, I'll be different approach. I'm sure Rafati has different approach. Uh, but for you guys, yes. exam, the safest way, it's because you can do the lock anesthesia, you know, just an exit low by film very quick and, and you get out of it, you know. If this is my patient, I am, yes. but you know, I'm different. I will most probably I'm going to open the groin anyway for axilla by fem, right? So what happened? I opened the femorals before I expose the axilla. I try in the vascular first if it's easy and went very easy and nice. I continue. If it's not, I just do axilla by fem. But for you guys, right. is that then... you have that's the best, safest way, just go like Zillow by FEM and get out of it. And fasciotomy because it's been how many hours? 12 hours? 12 yes. hours. So again, guys, you have to sure. answer the question which is for your practice. Like imagine you are in the clinic in real life. If you get this patient, don't waste your time with embelectomy and standing and all the things, okay? Because iliac let me, if you, I want to in the vascular intervention is different from the SFA and all the things because it's very easy to get to dissection, get to trouble, you shut down the renals. So you have to be very careful with the aortic when you have aortic occlusion because it's very high tendency to go sub antimal if you go from below. Unless you go from above, it's different. But even if you go from above, for people who have good experience, sometimes it could be a really challenging, you know? And this is the time, not right. the time, or when you have, a, a, what's his name, an emergency. But uh, in expertise, people must probably be able to catheters, maybe do some license and endovascular if it's easy. But for you, I low by is the best option. So, and also, Dr. Samir, let me just uh, tell uh, Dr. Ahmed one. So, I ask him by FEM is not a, a big, I mean, it's a big operation. It's not a long operation, usually. Okay. So, especially if you have assistance. Uh, and it's this operation is absolutely must to know you must know as a vascular surgeon because it will get you out of out of, out of trouble in the middle of the night in the, sometimes in your career. And also when you answer a board exam like that, you know I know people do crazy endovascular and things like that, like Dr. Samir said. But the safest answer is really ask him by him on this patient because you have you don't have enough time to do lysis, you don't have gadgets or to do you know back to me and things like that can it then be endovascular yes it can but but if you answer the board that you're gonna look as not non-safe doctor because you have to be safe here and the safest thing to do here like dr samir said is uh, is ask fem by fem so always think about simple things and and what's the standard you know it's not standard to do uh, endovascular for this case but people do it okay I that's just uh, I, 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 yeah. no. okay thank you sort of and not only service, even when you guys, you start your practice, do that. Don't do, don't try in the vasco when you just graduate guys and you start practice at least first three, four years. Just be safe. You know, Zillow by FEM is very simple procedures. And if you have, especially if you have two surgeons, you can get quick and you get yourself out of trouble without any issue. 
Because if you start playing with the wire, I'm telling you, you're end shutting the hair renals. I'm telling you from now. You can push the clot up, you can to dissect, you can to end with a major issue. Okay, any question about this one before we move? No? All right, let's go to the next question. Here we are, Six, 50. Let's go back to you, Bassam, because you run away. <laughs> Why you run away? The network, yeah, Dr. Sam, I'm not going to the internet. Sorry for that. Um, a 60 years old man with a history of atrial fibrillation presents to the emergency room with a four hour history of pain in the left lower leg and foot. On examination, the foot is tender to the touch and cool with mildly decreased sensation. Plantar flexion strength is diminished. Uh, the femoral pulse is palpable and uh, a Doppler signal present uh, in the posterior tibial. The right leg has palpable pedal pulse. Okay. Um, All right. And angiogram mm -hmm. is obtained following initial hypnotization, the most expeditious, uh, expeditious uh, intervention to restore perfusion is. Let's see the angiogram. Okay. You saw that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this so, is the PTL, tear tibial, peroneal, tear tibial. So you yeah. have a sitting here. The yeah, issue is the distal mm -hmm. is normal. This is the tear tibial. This is the peroneal. They are open. Okay. Yeah. So it's from so, uh, It looks like embolization. He's atrial fibrillation, Correct. and uh, presenting with two a, two B uh, rather mm -hmm. for. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So let's have a treatment. What do you think is the best way? Let's one by one. Okay. It's four hours history, so thrombolysis is one of the options. But see. Catheter directed uh, thrombolysis via right pedal, uh, pedal axis. Okay. Um, no, no, just a second. No, no, it's not okay because it's the left leg. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so go from pedal axis right to the left. I mean, come on. What yeah. is that? Never heard about uh, that. If I want to choose catheter directed, I will go from femoral, not yeah, uh, so this is not pedal. So this one is wrong, yes. <clears throat> Let's go to the next one. Catheter directed from lights via anti-grade left pedal, pedal axis. It's far away. No, uh, this also... is the same way. This is the left, the same leg. But they said anti-grade. It can't be anti-grade. It should be retrograde, correct? So this is wrong. This is wrong. And you okay. don't do this great with the thrombolysis because otherwise you please from the catheters. You don't give yeah. the cath you don't give retrograde where the blood with the TBA go back to you. You see? So you yeah. cannot do the access for that. So it's wrong. Okay. okay. Surgical thrombolectomy via left groin incision. Uh this is uh, accepted, yes. It can be done. But you know what's the problem with this one? When you do thrombectomy, you know, when you have a disc clot like that, okay? Yeah. When you do thrombectomy, we're going to go for GERT. It's, it's, yeah, it's difficult to go uh, selective. So uh, it will go direct to peroneal almost or uh, posterior tibial. <clears throat> so you're not able to clot, remove all of yeah. them selectively so, unless yeah. you have the mm -hmm. which one over the wire for GERT. Yeah. Or to go from popliteal approach. Uh, no, popliteal approach. What do you mean popliteal approach? I oh, mean yeah, below the knee. Yeah, below the knee exploration, popliteal. Yeah. And go selective. <clears throat> okay. okay. Uh, surgical thrombectomy via a left below knee incision, which is yeah, this is a uh, uh, correct option. Okay. Surgical thrombolectomy via a left posterior tibial incision at the ankle and retrograde embolectomy. No, this is wrong. So no the yeah. correct answer is E. Is what? D. Uh, D, yes. Yeah, just do a thrombolysis. I mean, just a small cut here. You expose everything, you do a selective embolectomy for all of them, you know? But really, also thrombolysis. He's what he's what to be or what he said. Prove me, but four hours. Yeah, it's still yeah. we can yeah. use thrombolysis. You can thrombolysis, but usually anti from fem from femoral, not from pedal axis. 
So yes. this is why he didn't put it there because if he put it there, it could be a right answer. So you have two right answers. So the reason why he didn't put it, you know? Yeah. He confused you with the axis because thrombolysis is a good option, but he confused you by the axis, you know? There is a why it's like a tricky question, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a tricky question, yes. You have to read the question. Uh, first. If you go back to the question, if yeah, you go back a... to the question, you know, he's asking you what is the most expeditious way. Yeah. To... So that means what is the fastest way you can get. So immediately you throw out all thrombolysis in this question, you know, because they're asking you what's the fastest thing essentially to take care of this. It's really it's a baloney incision, like Dr. Samir said, and you said, but you have to really pay, pay, pay attention to what they're asking you. What is, you know, uh, you cannot say thrombolysis when they're asking a question like that. So, yeah. So you have to pay attention to what they're asking, you know, on the test and then the, also oral, because they want you to understand also that if patient needs and it has an urgent thing and you can't just do thrombolysis, you know, you have to do open surgery and in this situation, the best thing you attack the problem. You know, you go down and you thrombolize all the, all the vessels. That's true. All right, it's an easy uh, question. Can, uh, can I yes. ask a question, doctor? Please, please. According to the nature of the uh, embolus, as it is uh, an old, uh, old platelet aggregate from the heart, does thrombolysis really work in this uh, situation? You mean this is an emboli from the heart? Does the thrombolysis work? Yes, it works in, in any emboli in the heart. Why not? What do you think? Why? Why? What you're in? Yeah. Let's count the tumor emboli, which is very rare. Uh, uh, the the embolus from the heart, it, it's uh, usually an old, very old aggregate of platelet organized and fibrosed. Uh, the I mean, clot is uh, tough to, to be lysed. But, but any clot come to the leg is going to be like that from the aorta, you know? But usually, usually what happens, because if it's an old clot, usually it's attached to the heart, will not mobilize, you know? So, exactly. so, so exactly. most of them are fresh because they are chronic. They already have fibrins attached to the heart. They don't embolize. So the one embolize usually is a fresh, uh, easy to break, you know? So the reason you have an aneurysm, so, we don't, we don't embolize the legs because all clots inside the aneurysm are chronic clots. They're attached to the aneurysm. You see, when you do surgery, you just scoop them out. So an emboli usually, usually, you know, 90% or 80% is, is a fresh clot. Uh, 100% I agree. Yes. But let me allude about one thing uh, since we're on the topic. What is the tumor, the heart tumor that embolized like that? They asked this on board. You gotta, so when she talk about the heart, so cardiac myxoma can embolize, you know, and that you cannot do uh, thrombolysis for cardiac myxoma. But like Dr. Samir said, you know, these uh, old, chronic fibrotic clots, they won't go anywhere. They stay there in the heart, you know. Only fresh clot can go for this. Thanks, sir. Uh, there's a question here. They said, Dr. Samir, Dr. Rafat, what is your opinion regarding management of acute limb ischemia in cancer patients? Uh, I think it's just uh, the same as anything else. The only thing you have to be aggressive post-operatively. I don't, don't think preoperatively or the approach will change. I mean, the same as any patient acute limb ischemia, depend how old and where the clot. But the only with the cancer patients, they are hypercoagulable, so you have to be very aggressive with them postoperatively. Uh, but it's the only thing I can think about. Right. Uh, Rafa, do you have anything right. in mind? So, yeah, for cancer, you know, if it's a limb issue, you treat the limb. But always when you have a cancer patient, you always want to think about prognosis you know of that patient so uh, what stage where he's at you know metastatic what kind of cancer but if you have a limb threat even if they're stage four and they have a few months you know you can talk to them and they have a right to live with a revascularized leg but you won't do bypass on this patient and things like that so so every time you see a cancer patient you have to be more specific about what's going on with the cancer patient but when it comes to a leg salvage you always hear on the salvage in the legs you know at least they're on hospice and they're dying in a week or two, you know, they do amputation on those patients. All right. All right. Let's give Ahmed Montaigne. Let's go next. Okay, we have some catheter directed thrombolysis is being considered for a patient with acute thrombotic lower limb ischemia. An absolute contraindication to thrombolysis is. Okay. Gosh, I'm sure you could get an exam. 
this changes from list to list, but I will try this one. He said he want the absolute. You know, it's no absolute. way to give it. It's not like relative contradiction. He said absolute. Absolute. Okay. Laparoscopy, yes. gastric resection within 10 days. This is a recent major surgery. It is a, an absolute contraindication, I guess. No, no. no, this is laparoscopy, gastric surgery. First, laparoscopy was in 10 days. And it's not a major. Gastric surgery resection is not a major. It's been 10 days. So I, I think this is a relative now. Okay. Right? Uncontrolled hypertension. In some references they say this is one of the absolute but okay. but in others it's a relative contraindication you can lower the blood pressure correct so no uh cpr within 10 days no not an absolute okay. contraindication presence of intracranial tumor is one of them in some references mm -hmm. And GI bleeding within 10 days. Yeah, this had this must be an absolute. Yeah, I mean, bleeding, I is is only, one. Uh, the only one I think bleeding is absolute, you know. Other one, I think is all relative, you know. But let's see what they said here. Let's see what they what they said here. Because as you said, they keep changing. Absolute contraindication includes what they said here. Active absolute bleeding order. Active bleeding disorder. Cerebrovascular so accident within six months. Some of them, if it is hemorrhagic or ischemic, ischemic three months. Some other references they say three months. Central nervous system within three months surgery. Head head injury within three months, and GI bleed within ten days. This case. So Relative maybe is a bleeding, and if you have any injury like in your head, because you don't want to convert from you know from embolic stroke to hemorrhagic stroke you know uh this is the main things okay what are relative relative contraindications are recent major surgery mm -hmm. uh, uncontrolled hypertension intracranial tumor pregnancy recent eye surgery hepatic failure cpr within 10 days and bacterial endocarditis yeah um yeah i think so but you, keep you guys saying, know why bacterial endocarditis? Because one of them detach from the uh, vegetations. It could be emboli. You can have a septic. You can have you can have septic emboli, and that's what that's why. Because if you lie septic emboli, you're gonna kill the patient essentially. So, oh, that's a good. That's a good point. So uh, let me ask you, Muhammad. Uh, when you yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm listening. Sorry. When you have an emboli, like in front of the heart, to the legs, and you want to do thrombolysis, some people, they do an echo to be sure no any clot left in the heart because they're afraid that if you thrombolysis, you may fragment this clot and go to the brain and cause a stroke. Do you do that routinely or you never do that? Do you do an echo to the heart or just... We do it. When we when we take this patient, uh, usually in our place depends. I mean, where you are, but I always we always do TEE, uh, transesophageal echo anesthesia. Does it in in the case, but if you have time to do, it, definitely you have to do echo before if you can. If it's if you know they have, or you can get a CT scan like Doctor. I think Doctor Osama said that last time, and it's a good uh, it's a good CT of the chest and abdomen. But we in our institution, and I've been doing, we always do TEE. It's readily available. We do it and we'll get it done because it may take a long time to do echo otherwise. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but this is a good point. Yeah, because again, guys, you have to be sure there's no clot in the heart when you do thrombolysis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Why well, don't ask a question, Mohammed? Uh, okay, let's say you have a clot in the heart. Do you, is this a contraindication, you think? Absolute contraindication or relative contraindications? No. No, it depends on how symptoms. If you get someone with a threatened limb and he has a clot in the heart, you, you can treat them, you know, treat, treat, treat the limb because that's can't wait. But then you have to treat the heart and then the heart can be treated in different ways. You know, you have to get cardiac surgery and to, they can do surgery because once you do surgery, you can't even do, sometimes you can't give heparin for a day or two, you know. Now yeah. that's the common things, but in this day and age, you know, 
Dr. Samir, what we do for these, we do, we do, we do angiovac for these a lot of times. You know, not we, but the cardiologist does it. You know, so so we just help them with cut down on the common femoral artery, and they do angiovac, and most of the time they get it out with angiovacs. You know, or if it's in the thoracic aorta, we do it ourselves with angiovac. Yeah. But uh, I think if the limb threatening limb threat, you know. That's a major emergency. It's like a life, limb, you know, that's a, one of the things that when people transfer patients to another hospital, you can't say no to those, even if you don't have beds, you know, when, when it's life and limb. You know, a limb is an important thing to fix with first, I yeah, think right. so. I agree with that, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. You want to read number seven? Let's finish 10 questions today, enough. Maybe three more questions. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Dr. Summer, 72 years old woman, uh... Is uh, eight hours status post pharmacomechanical thrombectomy and initiating uh, initiation of uh, ongoing right right lower extremity thrombolysis via a sheath uh, placed in the left femoral artery for acute limb ischemia. Intravenous yeah. intravenous heparin uh, heparin was given for uh, the intervention and is currently infused through the left. Femoral sheath. The patient now complain left limb weakness in examination. She is disoriented and is noted to have new weakness of the entry left leg and uh, arm. The most appropriate immediate next step in the in the management is. Okay, before we go that, so patient she thrombolysis. Okay, and she's coming with acute ischemia. You start thrombolysis. And the nurse call you middle of the night. Uh, Doctor Yahya, yeah, patient looks disoriented, and looks she has more weakness now in not only in the leg now she has also in the arm. So what do you think is going on now? Due to complication of thrombolysis and intracranial bleeding. All right. So that's what you think first, right? You think it's just the cranial bleeding, right? Yeah. This is what the percentage of intracranial bleeding you know with thrombolysis? I don't know. It's very low for one or two percent. So it's very low. But when it's happened, it's very serious, you know. So what's your next step? What do you need to do? What do you should tell the nurse? Here we are. This is four options. Start one by one. Publix of left lower extremity, femoral and infranguinal arteries. No. Yeah, because it's not the time. It's not your concern now. Because you don't think it's a weakness because of the worsening of the ischemia, weakness because of the stroke, right? Yes. Okay. Next. Non contrast CT of the head. Okay. Not in the next step. But I mean, you need going to do it, right? Yes, yes. But that's not your next step. Okay. MRI uh, brain. Okay. We'll start with CT, not MRI. Uh, okay. Stop the thrombolite, uh, thrombolytic infusion. Okay. Check PTT and refer to heparin if supra uh, normal. The next step uh, stop thrombolytic infusion. Patient correct. symptomatic, and they will do CT. Correct. This is correct answer. So when you tell the nurse right away, stop the thrombolysis, even if you have any doubt, because it's not you know, and you send them right away to the non cataract CT. You don't give a cataract, no need. You know why? Why don't give a cataract? Because you just want to sure to be sure if there's any bleeding or not. So you don't need MRI. You're not looking for a stroke. You're just looking for bleeding. So you don't need MRI. It takes too long, and there's no reason. You just they want to be sure if she has a bleeding or not. You're not looking for a stroke. So one contrast CT would be more than enough. But first, you have to stop thrombolysis. You can't send that to the CT, which still is thrombolysis going on, you know? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a simple question, but this is important. It could happen to you guys. Uh, okay, let's go back to who's there. Usama, you want to take it? Or Ahmed or Sam? Yes, Dr. Samer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me just do a couple couple of quick comments on this question. Right. So first, the practical matter. So they ask on boards this, and you need to know, how do you reverse the TPA? You know, TPA half-life is about half hour. Right. So this patient, sometimes you give them reversal, which is amino carbolic acid in this one. You talk to the pharmacy, they'll give it to you. And the second practical matter is, you know, you now you stop the TPA, and there's heparin infusion in the sheath. So you don't want to wind up with a cold leg from the sheath. So you remove the heparin from the sheath and you put heparinized saline like you do A-line. You know, the arterial line you do in the ICU. So you infuse that in the sheath so you avoid having a cold leg by the time you take the sheath out. Okay? 
or you can take it out in you know in about half hour or so. But you, you gotta keep that thing, these things in mind. I've had seen I've seen that before where we stop TPA and then the patient winds up with a cold leg, you know, and we could not give him hemorrhage. And we had to do thrombectomy. So that's important. It's just practical considerations for these cases, you know. So I, I think this patient, I mean, because that's happened, I think this now thrombolysis asks questions. So as you said, I revert thrombolysis uh, the TBA to cut a CT scan, and next thing you go to surgery for open thrombectomy because no more rule for any thrombolysis anymore, you know. So most of it is the end with open thrombectomies, yeah. Uh, any question, guys, about it? All right, let's go to the next, number eight. Yes, Dr. Samir, a uh, 76 year old man, a man uh, presented to the emergency room with an uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction and uh, undergoes emergent cardiac catheterization and stenting via a right femoral approach. The following day, he complains of significant bilateral uh, foot pain. Physical examination revealed, uh, reveals uh, palpable beetle pulses but patchy a bluish discoloration of the tips of the toe with both feet. The most uh, likely explanation is? Okay, so this guy, he has a cardiac cath, and after that, uh, he suddenly has discussion in his toes, but he's good, good pulses, you know? So, yes. And the, the toes become blue. So what do we call this one? Uh, From the name. Uh, yeah. Microembolization, what's the name of this syndrome? Uh, blue toe syndrome, right? The reason why it's a blue. Or tri syndrome, yeah. blue toe syndrome, okay? Yes. And this happened from what? For uh, From uh, microembolization of the. Right. Is this a clot or is it cholesterol? Is it a theroma or is it a clot? Usually it's an atheroma, okay? So it's not a clot. It's different from, so thrombolysis will not work here, thrombolysis, okay? Okay. How differentiate is that cholesterol is not a clot because a clot doesn't go to the toes. Clot usually goes to the major artery bifurcation, as you said before, anterior tibial, posterior tibial. Hmm. Probable distal pulse. They don't go. They are too big to go to the distal small artery. But the, but the cholesterol and boli are very, very small. So they can go through all this like a micro, you know, micro and boli. They go all the way to the digital artery and they close them. And Bish has severe pain because they close this all digital arteries and now become blue and cold. So the main artery is still open. The reason why you still have a pulses. And this is very difficult to manage because you can't do thrombectomy. Thrombolysis will not work. So what do you do? Let's, do, um, let's say what like the diagnosis is. You already answered, but you can go through it. Yes, uh, first to cholesterol embolization. Yeah. Uh, we said just it is uh, most likely a trauma and uh, more than the cholesterol embolization. Uh, B, thrombo thrombosis of the right external iliac artery. Uh, I don't think this is uh, the right answer. No, diffuse, yes, diffuse peripheral vasoconstriction. Uh, it can cause in other cases, but not this uh, case. You see, uh, yes, vasoconstriction can give you the same picture, but they didn't tell you patient on in in like but, in shock in high dose of vasopressors, right? Nothing mentioned in the in the history, so you cannot yes. assume that you know. So this is wrong, even uh, though can give you a similar picture. Next, uh, left uh, atrial thrombus, which is not. Uh, e chronic limb threatening ischemia of bilateral uh, lower extremities. It's not a chronic, something happened acute, right? So it's happened, yeah. so nothing to do with an chronic, so all acute. So, usually, the best answer is the first one, right? Cholesterol emboli. This is what's called blow to uh syndrome, okay? Yes, uh, let's go to next questions. We can ask who's there, but Sam, you want to go to question number nine? Okay, um. A 65 years old man uh, presents with discoloration and pain in multiple toes of both feet. Two weeks prior to presentation, he had undergone diagnostic coronary uh, arteriography via right femoral artery approach. He has palpable bilateral femoral, femoral popliteal posterior tibia and dorsalis pedis pulses. His past medical history includes 40 pack per year 
smoking history uh, for uh, until four years prior, uh, hypercholesteremia and hypertension. CT angiogram demonstrates diffuse atherosclerosis of thoracic and abdominal aorta. Initial medical therapy should include. Okay, so, so what does he have, guys? What does he have? Uh, the same uh, Pluto okay. syndrome yeah. due to almost uh, embolization from the uh, shaggy aorta or diseased aorta. All right. So this is most probably an is an cholesterol emboli. It's not a, yeah. it's not a clot. Again, the same. Why is not a clot? Because it's micro. It's very small. Yeah. If you have an mm -hmm. emboli, big emboli, usually they go at the bifurcations, you know, they go more profound ischemia. But when you see bloto discoloration, then with a good bubble pulse, this is always cholesterol emboli, okay? So what's yeah. the treatment? It's good. This is, so this is like follow up the first question. What's the treatment? So one by uh, one. Antiplatelet, yeah, single agent antiplatelet therapy. Okay. Um, or dual uh, antiplatelet therapy. Okay. Anticoagulation with warfarin, it's too much. It's not that good. Uh, it's not that good. It will not work. It's not yeah. like because it will not work. It's not a clot. Again, it's an atheroma. Yeah. yeah. So, it's not, so it will not work. Okay. The. Uh, Anticoagulation with rivaroxaban, the same. Will not, not work. work. Yeah. Single agent antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation with warfarin. Um, yani we go for antiplatelet therapy or yeah. single even is enough. Yeah. So it is not, again, you don't need to give anticoagulant. So warfarin will not work. So all those questions are wrong. So now single or dual antiplatelets. I don't or think dual, yeah. one is better, you know. So most of it's a single is enough, but you can give dual antiplatelets, you know. Uh, what else you can do? Uh, what what prognosis? What do you tell the patients? Because that's important. They want uh, to pain. They are severe pain. Yeah, he might go in into ischemic toes, and he might need uh, toes amputation later on. Yeah, or it might. It, uh, improve. It might improve uh, spontaneously with antiplatelets. Yeah, like majority majority are only the skin. So most of them, they don't lose the toes. They get worse, and then they peel off, and they, you know, they get a new skin. So majority are superficial, but very rarely you can see sometimes very profound, and you lose the toe. But the problem, you cannot do much. You cannot do thrombolysis. You can do surgery. You cannot do bypass. Nothing. You just give antiplatelets. Okay. And yes. you have to be careful next time, the shaggy aorta. So anytime you're going to intervene the future, you have to be careful. And I saw that, and it's very painful. And I saw maybe two kids yeah. after BCI uh, with similar things. The only thing we did differently is that, I don't know if we have an evidence or not, we put them on HBO, hyperbaric oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, they showed they improve with hyperbaric oxygen. But I don't think we have a strong <laughs> data to support that. But this is something you can offer it to the patient if you have it, you know. Uh, Rafa, what do you yeah. think about Pluto syndrome? So you have a lot of things to talk about it. Uh, maybe it's not with us. Okay, any more questions? Well, let's go to the last question, number 10. Let's go, Ahmed Munte. Okay, uh, a 67-year-old woman with a chronic obstructive coronary disease. History of tobacco abuse, factor five lady in presence with painful discoloration of her left great toe. Her foot was warm and well perfused with palpable pedal pulses. She was initially placed on Dabigatran, but presented the emergency department again with pain and discoloration of her right fourth toe. CT scan is seen in the figures. The most appropriate next step in management is, it's another blue toe. But you can see now the source here is embolizing, okay? Aorta has a thrombus, yeah. So you, what happened, they give a debigratran, but what the problem is that she came again with discorations, okay? So what that mm. means, antiplated is not enough. So then you have to control the source. When they came the first time, again, antiplated is enough. <clears throat> but when they keep coming back, 
then you have to treat the source. But we don't treat the source from the first time, first attack, okay? Okay. But this one is different because she came back. Okay, and now she has a force though, you know? Does that mean this is not stable plot? Or, you know, so she's implying from this one, from Shaggy Water from here. Mm -hmm. So you need to stabilize it now, okay? So, so let's see what Switch anticoagulation to warfarin with heparin bridge. The same problem. The, okay. the source is not controlled. Correct. B, perform an angiogram and initiate lysis of the lesion. You will spread more, more thrombi. Not, not only thing. You see, the clot is here. It's small. So if you give TBA, mm. most of it will go somewhere else, you know? So I don't yeah. think it's very small, you know? And if, if we, usually if she's not embolized, we don't do the, anything for that. If she's asymptomatic, if somebody call you, with this picture on like on routine CAT scan and patient has no symptoms, I will leave it alone. I will not worry about it. And most of the time, if you come after a couple months, you don't see it anymore. The most of them, they dissolve, you know? But should but we replace them in DOAC in that case? Sorry? Should we put them on DOAC if we see this? No, no, DOAC, no, no, no. If they are symptomatic, no. Asymptomatic, no. You don't treat them unless if they, you know, because you don't know if they're chronic or acute or, you know, so you cannot tell. So if it's, it's being there, you just found it on sedental by CAT scan, I will not. I may give it like antiplatelets, that's all. Single, but as prophylactic, but I will not give anticoagulation, no. Okay. So let's go next. So perform angiogram and sheet lysis, no. Because angiogram itself, it may embolize it and cause embolization. So you don't do that. Let's go to C. Stent coverage of the aortic lesion with a stent graft. This seems to be reasonable. Okay, next one. Craft for something. Direct femoral exposure with thrombectomy. This is a aortic, not femoral. Yeah, and even we'll not get it from the aorta, you know? We'll not get it. Okay. Then our open aortic exposure with endarterectomy of the lesion. Major big surgery for the toes. Yes, I don't. Because it depends. I did it one time uh, on a patient because she was 30 years old. And she was a distal aorta, close to bifurcations. And I don't want she 30 years, I don't want to put uh, on EVAR on her, you know? And she keep embolized from this lesion. So I just did an uh, open, small incisions of water, clean up the water, patch it and close it. And we're done with that. So yes, it's a major surgery, but if young people, active people, 30 years, 25, 30 years, uh, I will not put a stent, you know, on young people. Uh, then I'll go with an open. But of course, all people, how old is patient? 67, uh, no, I'll go with a stent, okay? Um, I think not, this is 10 questions. Not even with a small stent, like a Bentley stent, even in a young patient? I mean, you have to look at the whole things. If it's only, because this patient was only this area, if the whole aorta is disease and iliac and all the things you need to see more stent in the future, yes, I will do that. But the problem with this patient, I did have, she was close to aortic bifurcation, so I cannot put just a stent. I have to do bifurcated stent, you know, or put an EVA, which is not good in, in young people. And her aorta is small anyway. See, so young people, your aorta like 14, 16. So, but if it's a distal aorta and you can put short stent, yes, I agree with that. Or like close to like supraceliac, you know, like in thoracic aorta, of course, I'm not going to open the chest, take it out. But like my case was distal, aort close aortic bifurcation, only in this area, I didn't open, you know. So always you have to weight the risk and benefit. But this is one of the options, okay? Uh, there's two questions before we finish. She said, Dr. Simon, Dr. Muhammad, of unilateral thrombolysis to the limb, do you prefer to do a thrombolysis from epsilateral anti-grade approach or from contralateral going up and over and why? Uh, it depends where the thrombus if the thrombus distal, like distal SFA, mobility, and tibial, uh, we prefer to go anti-grade. If it's a clot, like flush SFA occlusion, close to the common femoral, or common femoral is, is involved, then it's better to go from contralateral. So this is the way we decide which way to go. Um, does high dose statin has a role in Bluetooth syndrome? Yes. Always you give statin with the Bluetooth syndrome. Yes, because it helps to stabilize the uh, clot, I mean the atheroma. So yes, you give antibiotics and you give uh, statin. Uh, this is all the questions I have them on the chat, guys. Any questions before we finish? Thank you, Dr. Samar. 
Okay. Some people suggest to do it next next week earlier, like five or six. Do you think it's a good idea? So this way you have your night free if you want to go out. You don't disturb your night. I think it's a good idea. Maybe five or six. We can do it next week. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Rafat, I think he left. Thank him again. And well, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Arafat, you still here? Thank you. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Thank so, you. Uh, thank so, you. Okay. Here. Thank well, you. Some uh, maybe uh, some word about Bluetooth syndrome because I asked you, you were not here. What do you think about Bluetooth syndrome? What oh, do you I'm have so sorry. Bluetooth. The one one more comment I have that maybe commonly is, uh, what is what do you do if you have a triple A patient? A lot of times we see a patient had aneurysm four cent four point five centimeter. Then they came with Bluetooth syndrome. So it's just like Dr. Samir said, this, uh, AAA, that one, if it's symptomatic, you fix it. Even if it's, uh, it doesn't meet the size criteria. Once they started, you know, doing Bluetooth. And I've seen, uh, I'm sure you've seen Dr. Samir too, uh, yeah. Bluetooth from AAA. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we so see the it. answer to that is just fix it. Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, I see that, uh, uh, that's the only thing that I had. Everything was uh, pretty, pretty good. Great. Right. So you are in your dental uh, office now? <laughs> Going for dental procedure. I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I apologize. I sent that message by mistake to my wife, but I apologize. So uh, ah, it's okay. yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm in the car. I apologize, guys. So it's ah, okay. I'm in the car. So next, All right. Take care. Next time, Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Okay. Take care. Thank you. See you okay. next week. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.